Good afternoon and thank you for joining this webinar from Yellowstone Advisory. Today's company presenting is Grit Real Estate Income Group. And while we're waiting for everyone to arrive, please could you respond to the poll on your screen. And just while you're doing that, I'm going to go through a few admin points for today. Uh, the format is a presentation which will cover an introduction to the company and the recently released half year results. And this will take approximately 30 minutes and then we'll hand over to Q&A. You're all currently on listen only mode, but if you do want to ask a question, please type it into the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Look, we've had a few questions uh, sent in ahead of time and we'll try and cover all the questions at the end of the presentation. Following the meeting, you'll be redirected to a short survey and it'd be really appreciated if you could spend a few moments uh, completing that. We're just gonna allow a few more people to arrive and for them to uh, complete the survey. Looks like today we have a majority of uh, non-holders. Um, the split looks roughly 75% non-holders and 25% uh, holders. So great to have a few shareholders back, but also great to have a few newcomers to the story today. I'd now like to introduce today's presenters. And um, we're really pleased to have with us today, Bronwyn Corbett, the Chief Executive, and Darren Beanhouse, the Chief Strategy Officer. Thank you for joining us. And would you like to start today's presentation? Thank you, Alex. Um, hopefully you can hear me clearly. Um, so thank you for the introduction. Um, as Alex mentioned, um, I am the CEO and co-founder of the Grit Real Estate business, and I'm joined by my colleague, Darren. Um, we will make this presentation as interactive as possible, taking you through the key highlights and the results presentation as at the end of December of last year. Um, and then obviously open up to questions. So if I can just um, remind the audience around the investment um, strategy around GRIT itself. So we are a business that was incorporated just over seven years ago. Our investment strategy is that we invest in commercial real estate across the African continent, excluding South Africa. We focus on global conglomerates and tenants um, underpinned predominantly by US dollar and Euro um, leases. Um, and our portfolio is multi-geographic and multi-asset class. You might have seen that we successfully um, completed our premium step up onto the main board of the London Stock Exchange. Um, and we currently have a secondary listing into the Stock Exchange of Mauritius. So, Basically, the GRIT business and foundation and fundamentals is born around the Africa growth story. Um, and as myself being personally invested and one of the co-founders in the GRIT story is that Africa is the last frontier. So what we are trying to leverage is we're trying to leverage off conglomerates and global tenants that have to be in Africa. Um, these tenants are supporting the needs and the growth of the African story. And basically, we are supporting them with their real estate needs. So as the business stands today, um, and as I clearly mentioned, the strong fundamentals and the delivery of a return of both distribution um, and net asset value growth, which is a target of around 12% in dollars, this is really fundamentally underpinned by the strong tenant base. And I'll get into some details around who our tenants are, the hard currency leases, the multi-geography presence, and the multi-asset class presence, which is proven to not just be resilient to an emerging market Africa story, but also under what we've seen as, as a COVID era in the last couple of months. So the business today um, is situated in eight African countries. We have um, uh, real estate assets in North Africa, um, West Africa, East Africa, and Southern Africa. Half of the grid world is exposed to investment grade Africa. This is countries that have investment grade ratings being Mauritius, Morocco, Botswana, and the other half is what we constitute as growth Africa. So countries like Mozambique, countries like Ghana. One of the fundamentals of the GRIT investment strategy is that we are a conduit or a bridge for developed market capital to invest in the Africa growth story. 
So the business has grown in seven years to a portfolio of just over $850 million. Over 93% of our rentals are collected in hard currencies. We are long dated leases. Um, 15 tenants um, equate to 70% of our rental stream. And this slide that Darren is on at the moment, um, we are very focused on what you'll hear me saying is counterparty, which is the strength of the underlying tenant or the underpin of the underlying tenant itself. So one of the main features is not just the, um, the tenants themselves and the diversification of the tenants that we have in our portfolio, but what's really important is the lease, lease period. So we have successfully paid um, 13 distributions to date. That is underpinned by the collection of, re of rental streams, but also underpinned by the longevity or the length period of our leases, which is just depicted here to be over 60 months. 15 tenants make up 70% of our revenue stream. And as you see from the slide, this is a diverse portfolio and diverse industry spanning from retail to hospitality, to logistics, um, to telecommunications. And that is really a big focal point of, of ours is that we want tenants that are sustainable. We want tenants that um, are able to sustain emerging markets. And where it stands now is that over 50% of the grid portfolio is exposed to light industrial offices and corporate accommodation. Corporate accommodation is predominantly embassies, predominantly American embassy, whereby we let out residential complexes um, on a long-term lease basis to um, uh, uh, embassy type tenants. But what that has shown us is over this period, over 50% of the portfolio, we have maintained collections. Um, we have over two dates collected over 90% of rental collections. Um, we've been able to um, sustain those leases. We've been able to negotiate longer dated leases over corporate accommodation. 20 uh, corporate accommodation industrial office. The balance of the grid portfolio is 25% hospitality sector, which is predominantly where we are based Mauritius itself. What we have seen is that our hospitality has behaved and performed slightly differently to hospitality and the COVID impact being that our tenants being Beachcomb and Lux have received major government support in Mauritius. The government of Mauritius has set aside $2 billion of support funding, which has meant that even though we've had cash flow delays, we haven't had to give any rental concessions to these tenants, nor have we had to um, uh, uh, discount any of their rentals. We've just um, uh, had to obviously assist them from cash flow, which to date that they've caught up a lot of their, their cash flow um, and repayment of their rental. The impact that we've seen, which is really the retail, which is obviously a big topical point, is 23% of the grid's portfolio. I'm sorry, um, if, I, if you don't mind me yes. interrupting, just I think it's important to explain that hospitality risk we have. It's not operational risk. So I think you know when people see hospitality, they believe we're you know, hotel operators and, and obviously you could run big losses. That's not what we are. We are... The, te the landlord, and we obviously tenant our facilities to big hospitality groups. And so you know, ultimately we're taking investment grade or you know, ultimately credit and counterparty risk on those, on those hospitality operators, which is why it's so important as Bronwyn has described that these guys are all getting really strong support. They're all very strong brands with strong companies and strong parents. And in addition, they're getting strong liquidity support. So you know, I think often we get tarnished with the wrong brush in terms of being hospitality exposed but it's purely as a landlord and not as an operational um, hotel group operator. Thanks, Darren. And, and uh, you know, Darren's just also reminded me about another point. I think a reminder to our audience as well that there are 54 countries in Africa. So the countries that Grit invests in are, have been pre-selected. Um, we have very specific criteria before we will go into a country. The ability to expropriate funds, the ability to move money out of these countries the ability to um, be able to provide debt into these structures, um, land ownership, regulatory. These are all key fundamental practices of the jurisdictions that we find ourselves in. Um, so really from an Africa, we try and provide a fairly mitigated Africa story or African investment for uh, the, um, the investing community to be invested in. So going on to the retail components, which is about 23% of GRIT's portfolio, Again, also retail has to be looked at at the different types of retail. 
um, sort of only 10% of that retail really is um, what we see is closed more. The balance of our retail exposure is really strip more convenience type centers, which means that there was some impact over COVID, obviously with lockdowns, et cetera, et cetera. But because these malls, these convenience centers are supplying basic needs to people, we've seen a better recovery. So as Darren's gone to the slide, our exposure into Zambia, Mozambique, and Kenya is exactly what we've mentioned now. That is the convenience um, supplying basic needs. Our bigger sort of exposure being 10% of the portfolio in Morocco itself, whilst we have seen um, a challenge like a lot of the other um, uh, retail owners, we have now seen a partial recovery into this asset. And what we had done is we had come off quite a large fit out or, or redevelopment of this particular asset. So we having to get tenants back into country and it will take us a bit of time on this particular asset. And this is demonstrated by the fact is obviously one of the most important is how much money are we collecting? What is coming into the bank? And ultimately, as you see, as I mentioned earlier, the portfolio over office corporate accommodation and light industrial has performed um, and we've collected rental. And where we've seen the, the, the more difficult touch points have been retail and hospitality, even though Darren has given you a really good ex explanation around our hospitality exposure. And to date, we've actually caught up a lot of the historic rentals that have been due to us under the hospitality segment itself. So valuations um, and, and determining valuations is obviously a key driver of our net asset value position, our loan to value. Um, and what we saw under COVID and what we saw specifically around retail was a very large impact around material uncertainty and where the markets were going under the COVID period. And that was significant to June 2020. So you will see that we took an almost 45 million dollar right off on our valuations. And just to remind the audience, as a London listed business, every asset of ours gets independently valued on an annual basis, which is June. And we had 80% of the portfolio valued at the end of December. So these valuations that you've seen, um, we believe that we've seen a very large hit on valuations thus far. And hence why you would have seen our loan to value track up. And uh, I think Darren has included that slide. And that's been a big driver under the valuations themselves. Um, but also the fact of um, uh, we have now seen a stabilization of those valuations and we're going to take some time to come out of this COVID period and obviously all the various markets. So we will probably see some form of recovery, but it's going to probably take a year or two thereafter. So Darren, I don't know if you want to touch on the key financial metrics specifically around the loan to value, as I've mentioned now. Darren, you're just on mute. Yeah, sorry, I was struggling to get myself off mute there. So, yeah, as Bronwyn's alluded to, what we've started to see is a tick up in our LTV, which is that orange line. And that was predominantly off the back of those valuation hits. Um, obviously, what's great about valuation is it's forward looking. So a lot of the pain and the, and the sort of operational um, um, stress that the assets are enduring now were recognized in valuation up front. And so I suppose as we come out of the COVID crisis, uh, as long as the assumptions or the experience is no worse than what the what was assumed in those valuations, we should be getting towards the end of that valuation down cycle. But clearly that down cycle ticked up that LTV, which is one of the things that we monitor really closely as a group. Um, but as you can see, we are getting benefit from, from um, debt costs going down and, and obviously um, a number of the other metrics in the group are really, really well controlled. Um, I think I didn't put it into the slide pack, but I think a real function of and a real sort of um, um, feature of what we've done is, although we've experienced some revenue weakness, we were managing to offset that with some strong cost control. So actually for the six months reported, we've, we've reported a uh, net operating income increase of 0.9% on a like for like basis. And that was purely off the back of really strong um, cost control. Um, a feature in, in, in our results is, um, is obviously the debt profile. And so through the COVID period, we managed to push back a lot of maturities. Uh, we have some really uh, chunky maturities coming up, up to, uh, for refinancing early next year. But now that we're premium listed in the UK, uh, we've got a couple of options. So it's either investigating a corporate bond uh, or a syndicated loan um, transaction or individually refinancing these assets. So at the moment, we're, you know, we're really well diversified in terms of our bank funding. And we, where we believe that we can, we can get back um, to those, those uh, well, we can get those refinanced and actually relatively well. 
Um, I think a final point on the balance sheet is, you know, we've mentioned that there's this LTV that is, has sort of kicked up a little. Um, we have a plan and, and, and you'll look at the dividend policy shortly, but we're, we're going to get back to 45% um, this year. And we have a strong plan to get there. But obviously the medium term target is to drop that to around about 35% to 40%. Um, I'm going to hand back over to Bronwyn because my dog wants to go out and is about to start barking. So I will let uh, Bronwyn talk about the pipeline in the meantime. Thanks, Darren. Um, I think the joys of us all being under lockdown and working um, at home. So um, I think from our side, uh, you know, Gritter's um, has been fairly acquisitive over the past. Um, and what we have done is um, we have now looked at the pipeline and understood how we're going to fund this going forward. Um, and also understanding value um, and what's happened with value. So, you know, we have um, decided to continue and pursue um, uh, three projects. Um, these two projects that Darren has left on the screen, I'll touch on in a second, but we are in the process of um, uh, building two healthcare projects in, in Mauritius itself, as well as um, a um, light industrial warehouse. Um, those three projects um, are being funded through preference type money from DFIs um, and Brit is able to put both its debt and equity and this is currently under negotiation at the moment um, and really just goes to the pipeline of Brit into the future. So because we have had quite a bit of success and um, the importance of our relationships with the embassies and that a, a large focal point of us into the future will be light industrial um, corporate accommodation, there is some office that we're involved in, um, there's some telecommunication space, I've mentioned the healthcare ele element, which is obviously very prevalent, especially under the social side at the moment, but the benefit of being multi-geography, multi-asset class is that we are able to um, really roll out these opportunities and look at the best, effect, most effective use of capital going forward. Um, we also have access to development pipeline, um, and that is through our development partner, where Grit owns 20% of that business. Um, and that particular business is rolling out a number of um, American embassy units, as well as um, data centers across the African continent. So the big aspect for us, obviously, as an Africa business um, is sustainability. Um, and we have the opportunity to make an even bigger impact because we are pioneering into a lot of these regions. So the ability um, uh, for local representation, Grit has gone from a business of five people seven years ago to over 100 people. We have localized a lot of our structures into these regions. That has been tried and tested over the COVID period because we've had not the ability to travel. So every country that we invested in, we have people that are sitting in these countries that are running the day-to-day -day operations. Um, obviously, as a woman-led business, gender equality is absolutely key. Um, and we boast some very, very good stats. And I believe that Grit is a leader in relation to this, especially in the real estate sector. And then the building efficiencies um, and carbon emissions. So sustainability priorities, we've identified four, and we are very focused now on achieving and reporting against these. So what was um, a decision of the board um, and very much deliberated was paying an interim dividend um, it was a relatively small dividend, but was done in the context of the fact that we did, we did collect cash. However, we didn't pay out the full cash distribution and we have held cash back in the business. Somewhere we wanted to land four key aspects. Those key aspects have been loan to value, as Darren mentioned. We have a, a, a major um, number of initiatives around reducing that loan to value number. The rental collections, as we demonstrated, have been quite strong, but specifically the hospitality sector, we wanted to land that. We've been refinancing a particular transaction under our drive and trading um, guarantee facility, so we needed to land that. And then generally, just to give us as a management team some breathing room around what is going to happen under COVID, the rollout of vaccinations, the reopening of the jurisdictions that we invested in. So that was really under the guiding principles about paying a reduced dividend and then understanding if we're going to do a top-up distribution, which will be around about a June of this year. So really, as myself, um, obviously running the business um, and with the team with Darren, um, there are six priority um, sort of aspects for our business. Um, and these have obviously been addressed over the last year and continue to be addressed 
um, and really key considerations. So the performance of our underlying portfolio is absolutely paramount. And that means keep on collecting the rental, the cost um, control side of it, protection of the existing portfolio, ensuring that we ensure the vacancy level. Yes, we've seen a rise from June of last year to December, but we want to keep that number under the 8%. And the team is working on that around reletting um, uh, and the importance of getting these vacancies filled up. The strength of the balance sheet and group liquidity under loan to value, um, the extension of our debt facilities, understanding different instruments that are available. Um, Darren would have shown you a slide where we are multi-banked, but we are looking at access into bond markets, different types of instruments like preference notes, the resumption of the dividends, which I've just gone through. And as I've mentioned, is that we have spent a lot of time on the capital structure. So it's now leveraging the capital structure to ensure that we have the ability to access the main FTSE, to access the all share index. Um, liquidity is really, really critical to the business. And then really looking at that pipeline and acquisitions and strategically looking at what is the enhancement to the grid business going forward. And then just leveraging off the Africa growth story. So we find ourselves in markets that continue to grow um, and markets that we continue to see future growth and the ability to grow and enhance net asset value of the business. And it's been able to use the, the, the structure that we have today and also ensuring that the share price through rates um, on, under the capital structure. So these are all very, very important considerations for the management team. And Bronwyn, if you don't mind, I think this was sort of the end of the slides, but it's probably worth us jumping, if you don't mind, and, and links in quite well with what you've just summarized there. Um, I think the audience will be aware that at the moment, we are trading at about a 40 to 45% discount to our NAV. So our, our latest stated NAV was $1.24 on EPRIM uh, metrics. Um, and at the moment, given the current sort of share price on a, on a converted uh, sterling basis, we're trading at around a 45% discount to our NAV. And partly we believe there's a, a few drivers of why that has happened. Um, you know, firstly, we believe that the market is unfairly Sort of tainted us with that same brush of being hospitality and retail uh, exposed and i think as we've demonstrated with a 91 percent collection rate we're just not suffering the same ills as as some of the other peers who have got pure play retail exposure um i think the other that's the one aspect i think the other aspect is we've always been a bit of an index orphan so we were listed on multiple exchanges but didn't qualify for indices on any of them uh, and our and our recent focus to try and get ourselves uh, set up and, and listed um, solely and, and primary on, on the LSE with the premium listing um, sets a nice real roadmap for us to get index inclusion here. And, and I've got some stats on the bottom there as what happens on, on um, the London Stock Exchange once you achieve both premium segment inclusion as well as <clears throat> FTSE index inclusion. Um, so that's the next step for us is, is index inclusion. Uh, and that will you know, hopefully spur on some liquidity because I think part of why the share hasn't properly been priced was because liquidity has been so poor that the market wasn't able to set the price effectively. Um, but those are all improving. And, and, and obviously as a company, we're looking at a couple of options with our sponsors in terms of how we provide more active market making uh, in the shares um, to provide two-way flow. And obviously some of the support of index inclusion and some of the other things will improve liquidity, which we then ultimately believe will lead to improved pricing of our fundamental story, which at the moment we believe is a little disconnected from, from, what, from what the share price rating looks like. Obviously, these are things that are, we can only do things in management's control, uh, and then ultimately the market has to take, it has to do, it has to value it correctly, but we are responsible for putting the building blocks in place, which we believe we've now done, uh, or at least on 90% through the way of, of putting the building blocks in place for the market to then effectively price the equity story. Um, and I think with that, Alex, we've got a number of other slides and we can get into a lot of more detail and I know there have been some questions. So why don't we hand it back to you for questions and um, hopefully we can cover some of those um, some of those that, that come through and we've got some slides to, to sort of complement that with. And I think I'll just leave that up on the screen so people get a sense of what our shareholder base has evolved um, over, the, over the number of years that we've been listed on the LSE. Perfect. Thank you, Darren, and thank you, Bronwyn, for that uh, introduction to GRIT and also for running us through the recent uh, half-year results. Feels like there's already been a, a bit of recovery that has been experienced, and hopefully that will continue. Um, we are now going to um, come to the questions. We've had a few, as I said, ahead of time. We've had a number that have come through during this presentation. 
And just a reminder, if you do want to ask a question, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please just type into that and we'll try and cover as many questions uh, as we can. Um, so let me just start on one about your, um, I guess, geographical presence in Africa. And would you ever consider going into South Africa? Um, so maybe I can answer that. So, so I think, and the answer is no, um, but I, I will give you a reason. Um, so obviously my background is that I co-founded a REIT um, structure in South Africa itself. Um, and basically where we sat at the time is that South Africa, when REIT legislation got promulgated, there were about 46 listed REITs in South Africa. So what we were looking for um, in the business that I was previously with is we were looking for alternative investment um, because the actual real estate market in South Africa is extremely oversaturated. Um, and one of my sort of parts to the business at that stage was then to look at the Africa growth story. So what, what we believe to date, and, and even though South Africa might look like an opportunity because REITs are so cheap at the moment because of what that's happened from a re-rating, for us, there's a number of players doing the same thing in South Africa. And what's ended up happening, as I stated, is that you actually have had an oversaturation of retype structures that look exactly the same. So for us, um, we have the opportunity to grow. Um, we don't have many competitors at this stage in the regions that we're operating. As it stands now, there isn't really any other business that is a multi-geography, multi-Africa play. So we've got a seven-year platform, probably close on eight-year platform, which we very much ahead of our peers and competitors. Um, so for us, there's absolutely no need. Um, the other aspect is that remembering that South Africa is a RAND economy and the focus of GRIT is to invest in hard currency and that is euros and dollars. So we give a hard currency dollar return back to our investors um, and with the RAND fluctuation and also the political situation in South Africa itself, over and above the real estate oversaturation um, South Africa would never be a, a country of investment for us. And I think just to overlay, um, just that the, the, the sort of uh, viewers are aware, um, the business of grit is based out of Mauritius. So although we both have South African accents, I live in the UK and I'm the sole sort of uh, UK representative and, and Bronin and the rest of the team sits on the island of Mauritius, which is a great conduit for capital flows into the African continent. They've got great sort of uh, DTA set up and a number of Sort of relationships across the continent which facilitate trade flow and financial flows um, and as Bronin's described you know, I think what we as GRIT have as six major gates of before we invest in any country hard currency is absolutely one of them and exchange controls in South Africa really push that um, into a very difficult camp. Um, I think just and we missed it earlier Bronin but it's probably worth us touching on some of these risk aspects and then sort of finally you know, what we do as GRIT is de-risk Africa. So we bring these multinational tenants and we de-risk Africa through these six buckets. But on top of that, we overlay a political risk insurance. So it's our doomsday scenario as Bronin keeps uh, describing it. But the good news is we've been through economic cycles and we've, we've seen Mozambique go through a downgrade to junk status, you know, come out the other side. And all through that time, we've never had to call on our, our political risk insurance because we've continued to collect in dollars move dollars out and have never had any issues around expropriation or, uh, or convertibility. So again, we have a lot of uh, risk layers in place and mitigating layers in place. Uh, and thus far, despite the various cycles, we've managed to you know, not have to draw on, on, on that doomsday scenario yet. Okay. Um, question here about the pandemic. So following the pandemic, there are some concerns about the impact of working from home on demand for office space in the developed world. What are the trends are you seeing on working from home in Africa? Yeah, Alex, um, that, that's also a very good qu a question. And it's actually quite interesting and it's become quite topical for us because what we've seen, and I'll use Mozambique as, a, as an example. So we own the majority of the A-grade office space in Maputo, which is the capital of Mozambique, which is tenanted by a lot of the oil and gas conglomerates, um, uh, Anadarko, ExxonMobil, and these buildings have been built very specialized in relation to IT infrastructure um, and a whole lot of other aspects to these assets. So what we saw is that when these countries went into partial lockdown, um, the staff were actually extremely eager to return back to the offices because the infrastructure doesn't exist in their residential homes. 
So these conglomerates have spent a lot of money actually um, ensuring that these offices are at a high spec to what their staff need to sit in. So the whole idea of work from home, reduced office space is just not relevant in these regions at all. Um, and as we've seen is that we've actually seen none of these tenants, actually none of the office tenants saying we want to reduce office space because people are now working from home. If anything, they've asked us to um, uh, push forward the sanitary controls and all the aspects to the facilities management of the building so that they can get their staff back quicker, effectively, because as I mentioned, the underlying infrastructure doesn't exist. So it's a very different trend to what you see in developed markets like the UK and Europe. Okay. And just to overlay, I think that the, the sort of litmus test is what are you doing on your on your on your leases? And so, as Bronwyn's described in Maputo, we are probably one of the key players in that P grade office space. We've just relit, um, and we've you know we've we've just managed to re re sign Vodacom, which is the Vodafone subsidiary in Southern Africa. And again, not a huge great change in any of their demand for for real estate. So, you know, what you're seeing here in Europe is. As leases come up for renewal, people are just saying we don't want to, you know, we, we're trying to cut space. We're not seeing that in any of our leases that have come up for renewal or any of the negotiations we're currently having. Okay, thank you. Another sort of a COVID uh, question. So what are your expectations for 2021 as COVID-19 pandemic will probably last a little bit longer? Many countries haven't started the vaccination program yet. The variants of the virus are spreading. There are travel restrictions worldwide. Um, what will, do you think will be the impact on hospitality, retail and offices in, in Africa? Um, yeah, so actually also a good question. So, you know, as I said, offices themselves, um, we actually see little impact on because um, a lot of these global tenants have ensured that their staff can go back to work, um, obviously under strict sanitary control. So, you know, hospitality, um, we didn't see a huge valuation movement. We actually saw it remaining quite flat, I'm not hospital, sorry, offices, we didn't see a major valuation movement and we, and we actually see offices remaining quite flat. So not there not been any material impact of sort of this COVID impact continuing. Um, what we're seeing under hospitality is that our hospitality is majority focused in Mauritius. So it's probably easier to speak from that side is that um, Mauritius actually has a very aggressive vaccination plan um, and has landed already 200,000 vaccines. Um, it, is in, it, it is looking at reopening the island once they've got 60% of the population. The population of Mauritius is 1.2 million people. So whereby other African countries haven't been as progressive around um, vaccination program, tourism is the heart with the financial sector, the heart of Mauritius. So we've seen it being very, very proactive. Furthermore, though, is that, as I, I think I mentioned earlier, is the government of Mauritius has provided support funding of $2 billion to the hospitality sector. Um, and Lux, which is one of our tenants, has been one of the first recipients of that. And that includes basically maintaining their cash flow position up until the end of December this year. And it includes rental payments to their landlord, which is obviously ourselves. So as Darren mentioned earlier, we take no hospitality operational risk. So we are purely their landlord. And even though we've had to give them cash flow sort of deferments and, and, and giving them sort of some breathing room, they still have to pay their rentals. So we've actually seen as of um, yesterday, Lux actually ca catching up all their rentals um, to this year already. We've seen a similar stance from, from the Beach Coma Group. Um, and then obviously our Senegal asset. So our hospitality is slightly different to what you're seeing worldwide. And it's become, it's because of the nuances or the support from government. Um, Club Med itself, which is in Senegal, has received massive support from the French government. So we've also been able to renegotiate with Club Med to ensure that um, their rental was fully paid up until the end of December. And then also now around um, the rental payments now to the resort reopening, which is positioned for October of this year. Now, retail, um, as I've mentioned, and is sorry, that- Sorry, can we just, yes. just, just to add on hospitality, I think our operators are seeing pent up demand. You know, So I think Correct. the UK was lifted off of the red list or Mauritius was listed off, list, lifted off of the red list for the UK as of two days ago or yesterday. And, and I think our operators are seeing pent up demand as soon as uh, flights are allowed. And I think as Bron has described, there are plans to roll out sort of safe environments. So each of the resorts will become almost like a mini quarantine island, if you want to call it that, where all the workers are, are, are vaccinated, all incoming passengers will likely have to be vaccinated as well as prove you know, COVID negative tests. 
But despite all of that sort of backdrop and infrastructure, we are still seeing strong demand. Uh, and I don't know about the, the viewers on the call, but I personally know that the first time I'm allowed to leave the UK, I think I need a beach holiday. Um, and, uh, and so I think we are seeing that manifest in what our operators are telling us. Sorry, back to you. For no, absolutely, time. Darren. And then on the retail side, as we mentioned, um, I think it was about 23% of the portfolio is retail. The convenience centers, um, which is around 13% of the portfolio, Mozambique, Zambia, and Kenya, bar us having to reposition tenants. We had some of the South African retailers have been struggling, so we've had to find um, alternate tenants. Um, the convenience malls, um, have really gone back to a relatively um, a stable uh, footfall for traffic um, perspective. So um, where we see obviously a little bit more pressure is our Moroccan asset, and it's just going to take time. You know, it's going to take time, obviously reopening. Again, this is a closed mall, but it doesn't, it doesn't um, need tourists to support this particular mall. It is supported by the local population, but we're now having to ensure that we get tenants into the, into the center. So Again, we see that this is going to take a little bit more time, but um, you know we are going through it. We are seeing positive movement on this, um, and each country, as you can imagine, and each asset class actually performs slightly different to the other. Um, and and hopefully that will give you an understanding of what we see going into sort of 2021, 2022. And a okay. final point to make on that retail side, I think people need to appreciate that Africa is different to Europe. So. Africa has dealt with a lot of disease, you know, across whether it's malaria, TB, cholera, I mean, you name it, Africa's used to dealing with disease. And although they closed borders, intra-country, there haven't been as nearly as draconian lockdown outside of Morocco. Morocco did have really strict lockdowns. But the rest of these places operated normally, um, and it hasn't come up, but I'm sure we'll link it in here, is that internet delivery doesn't work in Africa. You know, you just can't get a home delivery of your Tesco shop. Um, so people have to go out to shopping malls to go and do these these purchases. Um, you know, we're not we're not saying that internet will never have a high penetration in Africa, but right now the infrastructure doesn't support it, and so those convenience type destinations are still very very prevalent. I mean, you'll see the top right hand there uh, in Zambia, Kafuba, Makuba. Those two malls are you know 400 kilometers from the from the nearest large center. So you know people have to go to these places to get their basic needs and get their basic banking services. Uh, that will change over time. And we believe our assets are well positioned for that change as internet gets higher penetration. Um, but again, those the operational on the ground metrics are, are slightly different to what you see in the UK for a number of reasons, being disease burdens and, and stuff like that. Okay, I'm gonna move on to a couple of questions on the financials and specifically debt. Um, could you talk about the debt reduction strategy um, and also cover within that preference notes and Linking into that, how will you finance your development acquisition pipeline without increasing the loan to value? I'm happy um, to so start. Darren, maybe, no, yeah, maybe let me start and then you can just um, add on. So I think, uh, and I'm going to answer that question slightly back to front. So um, I think from our side, so we obviously recognize where we're trading um, from a discount to net asset value. So, you know, we need to, we, the, the pipeline is definitively there. The opportunity is definitively there. Um, uh, is quality pipeline, it's, it's anchored long, long-term long leases, dollar or euro return. So we're really comfortable with the, the quality of the pipeline and to understand now how we fund this. So basically with where we're trading um, on our equity story, what we have, are looking at is we're looking at preference notes um, to be able to fund these projects. Um, preference notes um, with DFIs, so development funding, um, especially around the healthcare side, which is the social element. Those preference notes will come into the business um, and, and we're currently negotiating both the closure of these notes, but also the rates. But as it stands now, are, are, are relatively well priced. Um, and the ability then to use that preference money into enhancing. So these will be yield and net asset value enhancing transactions to the business off the back of those preference notes. So the idea is to have those preference notes um, uh, and, and how they are put into the business um, ranked as equity. Um, and there's always a big deliberation is that is it debt, is it equity? But the idea is that from a, an accounting perspective, they will be seen as equity. So they won't put pressure on the loan to value side of it, but it does give us the ability to acquire assets and incrementally increase the asset value, which is ultimately going to drop the loan to value itself. 
And I suppose just to add on, I mean, these are relatively common um, instruments in Europe. So they're perpetual instruments in nature, which is why they achieve an, an equity accounting. Uh, Air France does them, a number of the French issuers have done them, a lot of the banks do them. So that perpetual note. Um, and then obviously what we're doing here is securing relatively cheaper funding, um, which specifically has to be applied to the hospitals. And as you can see, those property yields are about 10 and a half percent on the, pro on, on the hospitals. And clearly, if we can achieve a funding rate below that, it becomes accretive to our shareholders. And, and obviously, if you if you trust in the asset with a 15 year lease and you believe that that asset continues to pay through the period, these PREF notes are, are incrementally accretive to our shareholders. Um, and clearly, the only reason we're doing this is because our equity is just too derated at the moment for us to be able to issue equity to fund them. Um, but that's why these development funders who have developmental agendas are, um, are really need solutions for us to continue growing the business without putting stress on, on the share price. Okay, I've got a very specific question on the dividends. And that is what tax jurisdiction do your dividends come from? And is there any withholding tax? Darren, I don't know if you I, want to touch on I'll that, um, but just so that you are aware, so the, the dividend that we declare, so yes, um, in, in some of the regions across Africa, there is a withholding tax, but the tax that we actually declare in Mauritius and we pay to, do, um, to investors actually is a post-tax return. So the dividend um, that we are declaring is a post-tax dividend. So, um, and it also depends. So we will use leverage in countries um, to obviously re reduce the tax itself. And obviously there are double tax treaties, hence why we are based in Mauritius, um, because Mauritius has signed double tax treaties with a lot of the jurisdictions that we operate, which reduce the withholding tax. But the distribution yield that GRIT pays out to investors in dollars is a post-tax distribution yield. So Alex, I, I'm hoping that I answered the question correctly. Darren, I don't know if there's then, anything you want to add. The only thing to add is we're a Guernsey incorporated company now. So clearly Griegel is the, the Guernsey ent uh, entity that declares the ultimate dividend. Um, so to my knowledge, there's no withholding tax because it's a UK recognized jurisdiction. So for UK shareholders, there will be, in my understanding, no withholding tax um, for UK shareholders. And as Bronwyn says, by the time the money gets up to the Guernsey List Co, that's all post-tax. Um, it's tax optimized for, for, from, from the Mauritian structures, but, but that's obviously intentionally done. No, perfect. I think, that, I think you've covered that. I've got a couple of sort of linked questions about your retail strategy. So one saying... Wait, sorry, Alex. Alex, do, do you mind? I think I saw another question about the dividend while we just touch on this in terms of what our, our intention is for payout ratios. Um, so I think it's linked. Um, so if you don't mind, we can deal with that quickly before we move off the topic of the dividends, if, that's, yeah. if that suits you. So I think what we have historically done, and I've not got the, well, actually I might have the slide in here. Historically, the group has paid out closer to 95 to 100% of its distributable earnings. Um, the intention, and obviously that's, we're not a REIT, but we function like a REIT in many respects. Um, however, given some of the really strong growth and pipeline opportunities we've got, the board has allowed us the mandate to reduce that payout ratio and target somewhere around the 80% level. So once we come out of the COVID environment and once we come out of the sort of stress and the disruption to cash flows that we've experienced, I think we'll probably target to get back to an 80% uh, payout ratio, which will allow us to withhold some for, for, for growth internally, but equally still provide a very, very strong dividend yield uh, and, and cash return to shareholders because we believe operating in Africa it's got great promise, but you probably need to back it up each year with cash flow to, to sort of prove the promise is, is, is real in cash and not just a, a paper profit. Okay, thank you. So yes, we've got a couple of questions just on the retail sector. One saying your, your strategy towards retail appears to have changed over time. Are you trying to exit the sector? Um, and, and the second question I said is, is very similar. You stated a number of times that you'll lower your investment in retail. Will you de-invest from Morocco as it's not based on hard currency, or will you relocate your investment? Thank, thanks, Alex. And I actually saw um, it, in brackets Club Med at Isawera. So that has been the transaction that we've announced. So um, this individual actually knows us quite well. So I think um, basically, even pre-COVID, because we've seen success or we've seen a lot more focus or the ability to grow the portfolio of single tenanted type assets, um, you know, we have 
previously voiced that our pipeline won't continue to include retail, um, which we have partially disinvested out of our ANFA asset um, to our development company. And what we have said to the market is that we would like to roll our particular asset, um, being the shopping center in Morocco, into a REIT type structure. So REITs have been promulgated into Morocco. Um, and the idea is that our disinvestment would come through um, the ability to put the shopping center into a REIT. Now, the idea is that we don't, we're not distressed sellers. So we definitely don't want to dispose of retail at the bottom end of the cycle. But if the opportunity arises that we have a purchaser that is looking for retail focused business um, and, and the recycling of assets, and we are looking at some opportunities around that in itself, and we've got some partner companies that are looking at convenience type retail specific businesses, we will look at disinvesting out of retail. So the answer really in short is that we're not fire disposals, we're not going to dispose of the retail now at the bottom of the cycle, but on a medium to longer term approach, the futures of grit is to reduce its retail exposure into the future. Now, around Morocco itself, um, we have always been really excited around Morocco because of the liquidity, because of the REIT legislation, and the idea around um, rolling ANFA into a REIT um, and also then looking at um, Club Med Isarera. As you know, we own Club Med in Senegal. So the idea is that we like to follow our tenants and we like to follow the counterparties. Um, so the Club Med relationship in Morocco is led by our Club Med relationship across the rest of the African continent. And that really goes into the actual tenant itself. Um, and also the fact is that we do have the ability not to sign the lease in Moroccan dirhams, but actually to sign the lease in hard currency because it is club med. So it goes back to our strategy around hard currency leases not being linked to, to, um, uh, to local currency. So hopefully that contextualizes where we are from a retail strategy perspective. And I'm not sure, Darren, if you want to add anything. Perfect. We've got a, quite a few questions. So I'm going to try and go through these quite quickly. Okay. To make sure we try and cover them all. They're two linked here. Are you going to issue preference shares and will the preference shares be publicly listed or will they be available to retail investors? So Darren, I don't know if you want... No, no simple yeah, answer thanks. no, because these pref notes are being issued to the DFIs. So the government-backed institutions who have development agendas and mandates for the continent. So these will be private placements to those. Okay. Uh, then looking specifically at Mozambique, how large a threat is the insurgency in northern Mozambique? And is it localized? Is it likely to spread south? So, Darren, I don't know if you want to touch on that because we were debating it this week, actually. Um, and, Darren, I don't know if you want to touch on it and I can add on if there's anything else. Absolutely. I think people don't realize the size and scale of Mozambique. So, from north to south is the distance from London to Frankfurt. I mean, it's a massive distance. Um, and often what happens in Mozambique is there's a north and a south. and and what happens in the north is completely disconnected from what mm. happens in, in the other side of the country. Um, so having said that, I mean, it's atrocious what, what is happening in isolated pockets in, yeah. northern, in northern Mozambique. Um, and obviously our international um, uh, oil and gas tenants are the ones who are exposed to that because their head offices all sit in Maputo, which is right in the south, and their Pemba operations are right up in the north. So these guys fly in and out. What they've got is some security protocols around a little island and a sort of a finger out island, which they can provide security for their own staff. So thus far, it has not had a huge impact in what they're doing up there. And obviously um, they're monitoring the situation, but no, it hasn't had any direct impact. Obviously what we worry about is the long-term impacts for Mozambique because Mozambique, if people aren't aware, is a really exciting country with the fourth largest reserves of natural gas in the world. They've just had lots of stop start goes at monetizing that gas and this is just one of those potentials to to sort of delay the monetization because a very simple stat their gdp was 16 billion dollars in 2016. the fids that these oil and gas companies are taking are closer to 50 billion dollars so the context of the investment relative to the size of their economy is massive and the opportunity is great but they just need to get through some of these um, sort of domestic issues, which you know, at the moment we don't have, you know, they don't seem to have answers for. Okay, thank you. Do you have any plans for share buybacks? I'm gonna- I'll try that one again if you want. Yes. <laughs> so yes, the short answer is yes. I think at the moment, given the, given the, uh, the discount to our own shares, it's one of the best investments we can make. We're talking to our sponsors currently on the best structure for that. So 
Um, there are some, some, some practices here in the UK, which are sort of a treasury buyback program, which I think we're investigating and, and obviously we'll make announcements in due course. Okay. Um, there's some terms here I'm not familiar with, so hopefully you are. So I asked the question um, regarding sustainability, are you planning to achieve international certi certification for your assets? And they've given some examples of EDGE or EDGE, LEED, L-E-E-D, or HQE labels. Yeah, thanks, Alex. And um, actually, um, the answer is yes, and, and specifically under EDGE itself. So um, we definitely are sustainability is a key criteria for us. Um, it's important for our pension funds. We've got a lot of pension funds that are invested in GRIT. Um, the DFIs, development funding, is also really important. So we work in conjunction with them. But yes, it's definitely an intention for us to go um, down the road from that from that perspective. And and, and the the actual one that we're looking at is Edge itself. Okay. Um, question here: You've historically had a high dividend payout policy, supporting the majority of your twelve percent return target. How should we think of the balance between NAB growth and dividends to achieving your stated 12% return target going forward? And I, and I guess just linked to that, what does an 80% payout ratio equate as a dividend yield on the current share price? Um, so let's take it the other way around. So we produced nine cents of distributable earnings. So prior year, we paid 12 cent dividend. Um, last year, in the, co in, the, in the throes of the COVID environment, we produced a nine cent distributable earnings. So clearly, 80% of that would get you to the seven, seven and a half percent. We'd obviously hope distributable earnings will recover post a COVID world. Um, so, you know, we can't really give absolute guidance on what that number looks like, but you get a sense it sort of came from 12 operational earnings dropped down to nine, and we could have supported a seven and a half percent um, payout. And clearly, as that ramps up again, we might not get to the full 12 cent payout as we were before, but on current share price, that would be something silly like a 20% dividend yield. Um, and then linking that back into why we why are we retaining some cash is previously when GRIP was set up, it was only set up to have income producing assets. And so, you know, literally that yield was supported purely by the lease income stream. But there was very little ability for us to grow the value of the business. And so if you see on that right hand side there, the three aspects of how we're going to do things going forward is we obviously are today invested principally in income producing assets. But with some of these developments, we have the opportunity to share in the returns of developments without taking development risks. And that is through pre-funding of these developments. So you give the developer an upfront cash payment or, or security and you get involved in that development and that helps you deliver NAV. So our 12% total return guidance still stands. Um, we don't give a split between what that is made up in terms of dividends and in NAV growth, but we're pretty comfortable to achieve that 12% total return. And the balance will be made up from a number of exciting opportunities that we've got on the development side to drive NAV. Okay. And in terms of NAV growth, what sector do you think has the greatest opportunity and what country do you see as the greatest opportunity? That's a good, good, very good question. Um, so, you know, what we are seeing from an NAV perspective is that um, really around the corporate accommodation, as I've mentioned, um, the embassy work that we're doing, uh, we've seen a good trajectory, obviously, of growth around those assets. Um, light industrial, um, supporting just the, the, the growth of the African story, um, offices to, to an extent, but to, to a lesser extent, and then really the countries that we're seeing um, a major component of growth. So a country like Senegal, um, a country like um, Ghana to an extent, um, a country like Kenya, we're seeing a lot of growth in um, even Mozambique, we're seeing growth in that particular country. So the opportunity to leverage off the, the African growth story and being able to support the real estate into just the basic needs um, going into these markets is really, really key. And, and that's where we see the, the greatest opportunities from a net asset value growth perspective. And just to tie it in, I think, again, our focus is tenant led. So what we do see, we're Correct. relatively agnostic to the sector. So what we are seeing is exciting developments on the, in, on the telecommunications um, clients. And we're obviously seeing exciting opportunities amongst that sort of supply chain across Africa. And if you, you type with the right tenants, you become relatively agnostic to you know, which building and in exactly which country, obviously, as long as it forms part of our eight um, countries of investment today. Excellent. We are drawing to a sort of close now. I know we've got time for at least one more question. So 
Here we go. Can you can you give us an update on the driving trading refinancing? Does that make sense? So, to you? yeah, yes, it does. Thank you. So, thanks, Alex. Yeah. So, I think just quickly historically, um, when we uh, obviously we came out of um, uh, South Africa, um, one of our biggest investors um, and continues to be is the Public Investment Corporation, which is the largest pension fund across Africa, and they had a very large black empowerment. Um, a sort of drive whereby we had to put together a consortium to invest in, in the grid business. So the drive and trading transaction is inherently um, that comes from the empowerment transaction. That um, deal was historically um, funded by Bank of America, BAML, um, and we have been refinancing that transaction with the PRC, who, who is going to become the debt provider for the transaction. So um, we haven't been necessarily happy with the terms, so we've been in quite lengthy discussions with them. Um, and we possibly imagine that it will have to come back to shareholders to, to vote on this, uh, this particular transaction because the PRC is seen as a related party. But we are in the midst of actually finalizing negotiations under that facility. Darren, I don't know if there's anything you want to, to I think add. the only thing is, yeah, the only thing is we would obviously like to have it resolved before the financial year end. Um, but we're actually at the behest of, of the PIC and their process. So, you know, right now that would be our target, but we obviously don't want to commit to that um, because we want to do the right deal. And obviously we want to be transparent and bring that back to shareholders when that transaction has been settled. Um, the reason I've got the slide up and, and Alex, the reason it's there is it's one of the four bullet points we want to resolve um, to give us better visibility of um, being able to pay out at a, at a higher distribution. Perfect. Thank you. And we've got one, one last question here. So um, Yum Brands have been trying to grow their restaurants um, in Africa, specifically KFC, um, and that growth has been sluggish. If they're struggling, how do you see the prospects for international brands growing in the retail and hospitality sector? Um, and given your exposure, does this worry you? And linked to that, will mall development continue to expand as Africa continues to urbanise? Yeah, so maybe I, um, Darren, I can just uh, start with that. So I think what's really important is, as I mentioned earlier, um, there's different types of retail for Africa. Um, and where there's definitively a need is convenience retail, which is basically um, supplying basic needs um, to persons um, in particular regions which, who are traveling six, seven hours to be able to go and do their day-to-day -day shopping. So that convenience strip more sophisticated warehousing type retail, um, we believe um, there is definitely a growth story and a need for that over across Africa. Um, the sort of more super regional shopping centers, um, we've seen retailers generally struggling as, as has been correctly said there. Um, so we are not in the business of that, that larger type retail. Um, and for us, um, we would be more involved in light industrial type retail warehousing um, where sort of these food anchors like Carrefour are looking for those type of structures. So on the hospitality, I see hospitality was mentioned. Our focus again is specific hospitality in regions like Mauritius, um, which is driven by tourism. Um, we don't see that growing across all the regions that we operate in, definitively not. And as Darren keeps on saying, we are tenant led um, and we're dealing with specific operators across these regions. Um, so that's really, sorry, Darren. Sorry, as you say, a final thing to overlay, I think you have to think of Africa as development stages. You know, so this first leg of development is probably delivered through multinationals coming onto the continent, providing development and infrastructure. Once that happens, the economies will stabilize and you'll get that kick on to consumers. You know, we're just not there yet. Um, so the longer term, those sort of young brands and some of the other brands coming onto the continent, they definitely have a role to play in the future. But today, with currency volatility and economic volatility that happens in country, it becomes very difficult to put a sustainable business together. And you see a lot of the retailers who have tried are now exiting Africa because they just can't make it work yet. But it will come. It just probably needs first a first layer of infrastructure to develop, a lot of the economies to stabilize, a lot of their currencies to stabilize. And then the next layer, probably five to 10 years down the line, will be more of these consumer brands will come onto the continent. But you know, we'll be there, but right now that's not how you make money in Africa. Great. Thank you. Bronwyn, uh, Darren, thank you very much for those uh, uh, for the presentation. Thank you for answering all those questions uh, so clearly. We've come to the end of our time today. So thank you to uh, everyone for attending.
Um, as you leave today's um, webinar, you will come to a short survey. We'd really appreciate it if you could uh, complete that. I know the management team feed finds the feedback very valuable. So please just spend a couple of minutes completing that uh, that survey. Um, and I just want to flag up a, a couple of webinars with coming up uh, going forward. Bit of an Africa theme. We've got a webinar with Tullow Oil tomorrow. Um, we've got a webinar with Kenmare uh, next week. Uh, all details on the Yellowstone Advisory uh, website. So thank you again for, um, for coming today and uh, hopefully see you soon. Thank you, bye-bye. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Bye. cheerio. Thanks, bye-bye.